Welcome back to Desire Made Real, a Discovery of Witches podcast where we recap every episode of the television show spoiler free. I'm one of your hosts, Mandy Kay, and when I'm not talking about Matthew and Diana, I am currently binge watching CSI or some other murder type show. And I'm Caitlin, and when I'm not talking about a Discovery of Witches, currently I am reading The Murderbot Diaries by Martha Wells. And I highly suggest you all too for a good sci fi laugh. Sounds good to me. Each week here on the show, we'll recap the episode, spoiler free. We'll also include a segment at the end to discuss the books, how well the adaptation works, and we will likely dive into some spoilers here. But don't worry, we will give you plenty of warning before we get there. Episode one was written by Lisa Holdsworth and directed by Jamie Donahue. I don't know if I spelled his name right. I'm unsure about that. Gee, nobody can see. It doesn't matter. (laughs) <laughs> you probably said it right though so hey hopefully so here we are <laughs> back for our final season oh it is the final season uh i'm sad about that because it means we're not going to have any you know more great material to podcast about but i actually also really like that they are you know the source material ends and so they're ending they're not going to keep trying to make up stuff to fit into this world yeah i'd be more sad about it if we didn't do other podcasts together already. Fair enough. Yeah. But yeah. because we do, I'm like, this is ending, but we're not ending. Right. Exactly. So previously on, we got a kind of long previously on to start us out, but I'm glad mm-hmm. because it has been a little while since we had a new episode. Yes. Um, so they just wanted to remind us that Diana got Philippe's blood vow. Benjamin exists. Blood Rage vampires exist. Sophie had a witch child. Agatha threatens Peter, and Peter killed M. Like it was like bam, 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 like all lined up. All of the little things you just need to know to get into this episode. It was a very good recap, especially since I did not make time to rewatch season two, which now that we're here and we're, we are recording, feels really dumb. <laughs> it's it's been a busy couple of weeks. Yeah, that's true. So, all right. And then we jump into, I, I'm not even going to say the episode proper because it is kind of a cold open, yeah. even though it's multiple scenes before we get to the credits. Um, but I think they did this really, really well because, you know, season two ended with Peter killing M and then Matthew and Diana deciding, okay, we're going back. Like, that's it, right? Kind of the way season one ended. And we were like, well, did they make it back to the past? Right. They kind of did the same thing because they didn't show us the journey or that they had made it. It's just, okay. we're going to do this. We're jumping in. And so we we jump in this episode. Uh, Matthew and Diana have returned home to find Sarah at M's bedside with M dying. I was just going to say, I'm so happy that they showed M dying, which is a weird thing to say. (laughs) Um, But I like it because it gave the actress a chance to come back. You know, and I really like the actress, so I'm glad she was here. Okay, that's fair, but I think, like, emotionally, I think it's worse. This is my note. I think it's worse that she was still alive for a moment when Diana returned. Like, Diana shows back up from the past after being gone for however long she was gone. She doesn't get to talk to him. She walks in to him, laying in the bed. Her eyes flutter open, and then she immediately dies. That That is kind of hilarious, actually. <laughs> Maybe not. And it's... It's it's like, wait, that's just like emotionally heartbreaking, you know, and I guess I I understand why they did it, especially since we had been talking about will they or won't they with the whole ghost thing. And of course, they're not going to. So it did give us that closure that we needed here in the beginning of season three. But it's just I feel like having her come home and find out that M had died versus getting home and just watching her die like literally that's what happened (laughs) they get home and she watches him die and it's just so terrible it's terrible i don't know i i did just before we started recording i kind of skimmed over that part in the book Mm -hmm. and in the book diana and matthew get back it feels like at least days but it feels more like weeks Mm -hmm. after m dies yeah and i feel like that would be even worse because she just wouldn't be there and it wouldn't feel real yeah, yeah, no, that's true too. 
That's, that, that's definitely true. And I'm, I am glad at least that Sarah had Diana to get her yeah. through yeah. right at the beginning. So it's, I mean, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that more later in the episode, of course. The rest of dealing with the aftermath of Peter Knox is we see Miriam making sure that Marcus is okay. Mm-hmm. Um, since Peter had knocked him out and we see Agatha leaving to go straight to the congregation. So it's like quick cut scenes of all of these things that are happening since Peter Knox was here. Um, and then we find out that Diana's having twins. Like all of this happens in the opening credit, like before the opening oh, credits. The twins is before the opening credits? It's before the opening credits. It's the last scene before the opening credits. Yep. I... I literally rewatched the episode today and I still had it in my head that nobody actually spoke words before the opening credits. No, they did. Well, Sarah did because Sarah said, oh, she's gone. Oh, you're right. And then we cut to Diana sitting in her, which I really wish they had touched on this, too, because Diana's in modern clothing again, right? Her hair's down. Mm -hmm. She's wearing a sweater and pants. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, but she's sitting there crying, you know, talking to Matthew comes in and she's talking to him about how it's not right that the baby is going to be born into a world where he or she doesn't know M and that mm-hmm. M doesn't get to meet the babies. And Matthew doesn't read the room and <laughs> <laughs> she's crying and he looks at her and he just says two heartbeats. Um, and she's like, two babies. And then we go to credits. To be fair, I think he was trying to cheer her up a little bit, give her some good news. I don't think he was like, yeah, fuck him. Let's concentrate on this. <laughs> right, right. No, no, not at all. I'm just not sure that it carried. I, I'm not sure it carried the levity that it was supposed to. Right, yeah. Um, or like maybe there needed to have been more words like, you know, I know it's really hard and it's really sad, but here's a little bit of good news instead of him just saying two heartbeats. Right. I don't know. I, maybe I just wanted a little bit more. I guess, but I mean, they're trying to cover a lot in this episode. And God, this episode felt like it was so long. And yeah. then when I rewatched it so I could take my notes, I was like, oh my God, there are so many cutscenes. Like it's just back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Yes. I will say, or I have a question. Um, in this little opening segment, as you said, mm-hmm. Diana and, and Matthew are briefly still in their Elizabethan outfits. Do we think that Matthew had fake facial hair on? I don't even know. They kind of keep him in the background and in the shadows. So I'm going to go with yes. I wasn't, I honestly didn't even pay attention because I was mostly watching her face. Yeah. To kind of see like how she was reacting to what was going on and stuff. I think they did that on purpose. Uh, mm, interesting. Because he does go back to being clean shaven very quickly. <laughs> yeah, right away. And I get the feeling just from press photos and like of him around Mm. that Matthew Good prefers to be a clean shaven person or at least maybe his work prefers him to be I don't know he uh I I kind of like the scruffiness though as as we talked about extensively last I do miss it yeah (laughs) and the cape and and I miss Diana's Elizabethan outfits but I do love the sweater she's wearing here yeah I had forgotten how awesome her hair looks down, too, because she has so much of it. And yes. we didn't get to see it down hardly at all last season. So it was, it was nice. It was nice, yeah. Yeah, then we have opening credits. And I have to tell you, I don't know if they're the same or different from last season. There were a couple new scenes, but not many. Um, it mostly looked the same. I know they added, and I don't even know if they added it this season or last season, but my favorite scene from last season is her in the dress opening her eyes. I think that um, was their last scene. Um, and then I noticed the the scene where they're all putting their hands on the sword. I don't recall that being in there last season, but it may have been. No, that's that's from the, this season. That hasn't okay. happened I yet. I thought so. I was thinking, I don't remember seeing that, except, like, I don't know. It just, it feels so familiar. Mm-hmm. But I didn't remember it being in there. Um, but I couldn't pinpoint it, and I didn't want to go, like, searching for all the various <laughs> opening credits and compare them scene by scene. There were a couple other new scenes, but not not too many. There was one of her doing magic for sure with her hands. Um, but I think since that she learned the knot, was from knots. last season. Well, okay, never mind that. Now I don't know. I, I give up. <laughs> but you're ma- I, now. I'm doubting everything that I have in my head. So, who knows? 
those are just the, the scenes that stood out to me as potentially being new. I know they weren't in the first season credits. How about that? Well, there were no credits <laughs> in the first season, so. Really? <laughs> Have yes. I forgotten that completely? Yes. Oh. Yes, there was. Well, good gracious. There's okay. not an opening credit sequence in the first season. Okay. Well. So, I mean, you're not wrong. They definitely weren't there. <laughs> it's all new from the first season. Okay. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Did you tear up immediately after the opening credits just like I did? N- no. No? I cried a couple of times in this episode. Um, most notably, um, everybody gathers at Sator and Gallo Glass shows up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Modern day Gallo Glass shows up and Diana runs and hugs him and I teared up. I did. Oh, interesting. I, I don't. I don't like him as much in his modern look. Like, looks-wise, obviously, he's exactly Oh, the I same. do. <laughs> I like him with short hair. Very much so. Uh, it's nice. That whole, he's got that biker vibe going on. I'm here for it. I, I mean, I'm not saying it's bad in any way. I'm just saying I preferred Elizabeth and him. I mean, I prefer Elizabeth and everyone. If, if it were up to me, everybody would join hands mm. and time travel back and change outfits. I would like to see Alex Kingston and Elizabeth exactly. and Garb. You know, great. strangely enough, like I haven't watched Doctor Who in years, but when I was taking my notes today, my like automatically I wrote her name or I had to stop myself from writing River instead of Sarah. Oh, interesting. <laughs> I haven't watched Doctor Who in years. It was very strange. Yeah. Interesting. But yes, um, I would love to see her in Elizabethan. Sorry. Move on. Yeah. So, yeah, people, I mean, we just get the shot of everybody. Matthew and Diana are back, so people are now coming to Sator where they are. They have to catch Matthew and Diana up. And Hamish is back. Hamish is back with his helicopter, which I love. I missed Hamish last season. So we get, you know, the, the main thing for me in this scene is Alex Kingston. She doesn't speak in this scene, but her grief is palpable. She's a great screen. actress. Rain, Like, she's just... She is broken, and you can see it. She doesn't even need to speak. Yeah, she's um, fabulous. And then they catch Matthew and Diana up on what's going on. They tell him about the vampire murders that have been happening in Oxford. Um, Matthew and Marcus's like facial expressions in this are great, and you can really see the family resemblance of unhappiness. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, then we do a quick cut to an odd scene where Phoebe introduces herself to Matthew. Yeah. And he just dismisses her. It really kind of upsets me. Yeah, well, okay. So I wrote down here that Angry Matthew is my least favorite Matthew, which is true. We get a lot of Angry Matthew in this episode, too. Like, his shouty. Yeah. Like, he's way more shouty here than he's been in the past. Yes. But the thing is, he's really taking it out on everyone else, but he's angry at himself. Okay. Yes, I see that. I do see that, and I hope that we actually get to experience that realization from himself later in the season. But Or I hope we get a real heart-to-heart between him and Marcus and not just, oh, that was spoilers. Um, Mm. (laughs) Well, I I just hope we get a real heart-to-heart from him and Marcus. I feel like we'll have to, Um, especially the way they set this, this next scene up when Marcus comes in. You know, and Matthew's cutting him down and telling him he didn't fulfill his responsibilities. And Matthew Marcus stands up to him. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, I love that Marcus stands up to him. I do. Like, Marcus has grown without Matthew here. Yes. He really did step up to take care of this family. And Matthew doesn't see it yet, but he will. And I love that Marcus calls him out on the blood rage thing. Yes. And I feel like we're going to have to come back to that. Their relationship is so important. That they can't just leave it hanging like that. Because we don't get another scene with the two of them, with just the two of them together in this episode. We don't. And I I just feel like knowing what has to happen plot-wise, there is a way that they could not have them have a heart-to-heart, but still have them kind of be on a better page at the end. And I just hope they don't do that. I hope they don't like just yeah. brush it under the rug. Yeah. Yeah, no, completely agree. We'll see what they do. I mean... But those two play so well off of each other that I think it yeah. it would do everybody a disservice not to have it. And and from the scenes that we do get in this episode, it does look like they're using the limited amount of time they have 
to show the character connections, Mm -hmm. which I'll talk about later. And then we have a really quick cut, real quick. I actually had to rewatch the scene and be like, I don't understand what just happened. Um, Mm -hmm. Because Sarah is at the temple where M died and the page from the Book of Life appears at her feet. Yeah. I guess they had And I was to... like, wait, what just happened? And I had to rewind it and watch it again and watch, you know, see the page appear. Yeah. Because um, before Knox killed her, Emily made it disappear. Right. Last right. season. And so, so it, they had to... it reappeared for Sarah. Yeah. Um, and then we get a scene of Sarah and Diana. And interestingly enough, this is not the scene where Sarah gives her the page. Because Sarah is angry. Well, I wrote down that I, I really love this scene. And grief rarely brings people together. So yeah, that's that's true. Um, Sarah's angry. Diana's confused. Um, Sarah doesn't react as Diana hopes she would when she finds out about the babies. I mean, her wife just died. You know, like I know, I know. What was um, Diana she, thinking or expecting? Yeah. Well, and Sarah also immediately. <laughs> I also found this interesting, but I totally get it. Mm-hmm. Like, Sarah is explaining to Diana what M was doing, and Diana's like, well, no, M would never do that. M has always talked against using higher magics, blah, blah, blah. And Sarah's like, well, she learned from experience, so she that's why she knew. And mm-hmm. then Sarah immediately turns around and asks Diana to use magic to go back and change the past. Yeah. It took me a minute to understand that's what she was asking because I first interpreted it as she was asking her, let's use higher magics to talk to M the way that she was trying to talk to Rebecca. Yeah. But Diana's reaction was, I can't go change the past. And so, like, that led me to believe Sarah was actually asking her time travel and change it. But either way, like, I, I totally understand Sarah's grief and where she's coming from. And I totally get diana saying no and i love the way that she did because she's like of course this isn't how things were supposed to happen Mm -hmm. m is supposed to be here m supposed to meet these babies she's supposed to be a part of our lives forever and i love the way that she addressed it like it was was good writing good dialogue there it is really good and it's an interesting change from the book because because it had been a couple weeks in the book since m died Sarah's kind of over that first immediate, no, this can't be real part of grief. Mm, mm -hmm. And so she's the one assuring Diana that everything's going to be okay, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting to change the dynamic between the two of them there. Yeah. And then we end the scene with with Diana telling Sarah about the babies and Sarah has a palpable reaction of, you know, are they going to be vampire or witch or something else? And she takes her hand away, almost like she's disgusted or afraid. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's a tough scene to leave this scene on. Um, it's well, tense. It is, but she ends it with like, "How on earth can you protect them?" So I think it's clear that she's not she, she's not going to be like you. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, she does come back later and apologize for it. So I, I understand. But yeah. it's still it, it's tough to watch. Yeah, it's I'm not quite sure what the next scene is. But my next note is I despise Knox. So. OK, Um. so the next scene is uh, Agatha in the boat on the way to the congregation, because my note is Agatha sunglasses are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I want those sunglasses. Uh, I do recall her coat was good, so. Yeah, yeah. She's her whole style is just fantastic. It's fabulous, yes. Um and I'm actually reminded of the when they did the the virtual Q and A as part of Comic Con. Yes. Like she had amazing glasses on in that. They weren't the same, but like every time I see her with glasses on, I'm just like I want them. That yes, you're right. You I know them, so. I think that's interesting because usually an actor and their character, not necessarily the same sense of style, but mm-hmm. she's always These two are pretty fabulous. Close. Yeah. yeah. Um, they also spend a lot of time focusing on the keys for the congregation again. Yes. Which I find odd because we didn't see any of that in season two. Like we got it when the congregation was first introduced in season one. Mm-hmm. Um, and now they're making a point to show that there's three keys for each creature type and you have to combine them to make a key and then three keys open the doors and so like 
why? Why did they spend precious, precious real estate on that this season? I assume uh, that a lot of this season is going to be congregation focused. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, we, we already know that Agatha and, and Baldwin tells us here that Agatha has called this meeting um, because she wants to accuse Knox of murder. But of course, Jer Bear takes over. I think and Knox. I, wanna... I, I would say Knox told him to do this. I just hate Oh, Knox. I'm sure. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Jer Bear, but he's just like normal evil. You know, he's just out for himself. Whatever. But Knox is such a smarmy little fucker. And I want him to die knowing that he's unimportant. <laughs> oh, I like it. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you that I'm sure, you know, him and him and Jerbear had, of course, set this up because they knew what was going to go down. And um, I think it's interesting, though, that the way the the way it goes down, basically, Peter ends up incriminating himself for the reason that he gets expelled from the congregation. I said that was so good. And so the way they handled that was it took me by surprise. Mm hmm. Because I, I, I have to admit, I'll go ahead and admit, of course, I did not reread the third book before we started recording. I'm sorry. It's been crazy. <laughs> and I just didn't get to it. Um, so I don't actually remember how this went down in the book. Well, we never, um, we don't see it in the book, obviously. But Knox does get kicked off the council at the beginning. Oh, the that's the right. Because the books are all from Diana's perspective. So we don't see any of this stuff. Yeah. Okay. That makes me feel better about not remembering. <laughs> Book three does have some things from a couple other people's perspective, but not not this. Okay. So, yeah, I, I actually I liked the way this went down, even though I wanted to punch Jer Bear in the face for talking all over Agatha. Um, even when she's like, excuse me, I have the floor. And he said, no, you're not important. What I have to say is important. <sighs> like, screw you, Jer Bear. Murder. So, Just murder. Yeah. Everyone kill the whole council, other than Agatha, yeah. obviously. Just kill them all. Um, let's see. So this is also when Baldwin finds out that Matthew and Diana are back and that everybody's at Sator. It is and... also our first time seeing new actor Baldwin. It is. Do you remember his name? I wrote down zero actors' names for this. Oh, I wrote down one actor's <laughs> name, and it wasn't Baldwin's. <laughs> so uh, Peter McDonald. Thank you. So, yes, it's the first time we see Peter McDonald as Baldwin. And I think he gets one aspect of Baldwin really well in this episode, which is the angry, I'm in charge of the family, and I hate that everybody likes Matthew better than me uh, part of, of Baldwin. <laughs> like, that comes yes, across no, he nailed that. <laughs> really well. Yeah. But the thing in the books, Baldwin does have another side where sometimes you're like, okay, well, I guess maybe he's not that bad. I do kind of, it's fine. And we have yet to see if the new actor can do that. Yeah. Um, he seems to, mm, what's the, so in my head mm. with Tristan, what's his face, who played Baldwin for the first two seasons, I confuse him visually in my head with Christian Braun. I have no idea who that is. He, he was in the Orphan Black and some other things. But when I picture Christian Braun being really, really angry, I picture a child having a temper tantrum. And so, so much of my, like, recall of Baldwin comes across to me as a child having a temper tantrum versus someone who's really just angry. And I think that didn't come across at all in this version of Baldwin. I just got, this dude is angry this dude is jealous but he's still very much a centuries old vampire who can control himself hmm. uh i just googled christian braun and got a basketball player so i i i'm at a loss there i may have said it spelled i think his last name is b-r-u-u-n oh uh, this guy looks like a million other people <laughs> in my brain when i think of baldwin that's who I picture. Interesting. It's it's weird. I know it's weird. It doesn't make any sense. But because Peter McDonald does not look like that at all, like it kind of changes 
my perception of him a little bit. Right. Interesting. I don't, honestly, I don't really picture Baldwin as anybody in particular. May, um, pro, like, um, as the Tristan, whatever his last name is. Oh, that's going to bug me. Whatever. Um, was it probably, he sort of infiltrated my Baldwin mind. Mm, yeah. And, and, and um, this actor, whose name we just said, Peter uh, McDonald. Peter McDonald has not really. Yeah. And I, I, I don't actually know their comparative ages, but Tristan looked younger, which I kind of associate with Baldwin, just because I feel like, as much as Baldwin is, you know, centuries if not millennia old, he doesn't feel like he's grown up yet. Right. Yeah. So I liked that they had an actor who looked younger. Again, that just looks, though. I actually have no idea how old they are. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. But I do like um, Peter's portrayal so far. I'll be interested to see if he will have the, the charisma, the, the charismatic side of Baldwin that we do occasionally get to see in the book. Rare, yeah. though it is. Yeah, we for sure have not seen that. We didn't see any charisma in this episode. We just saw, I'm in charge and you're going to listen to me. Yeah. There was one point where I think he thought he was being nice later on, but no. No. Um, yeah, so we do, I guess it does eventually get to accuse Peter of murdering M mm -hmm. and moves to remove Peter from the congregation. And in a wholly unexpected move, Baldwin seconds it because only because it's an act of war for a witch to go onto Claremont land without an invitation. Yeah. Like he doesn't care that Peter killed a witch, killed a witch. It's not any of my business, but you were on to Claremont land. So you screwed up. Yeah. But you know what? It got him expelled from the congregation because everybody, including Gerbert and Satu agreed. Uh, not Gerbert. Gerbert voted for him to stay. Okay. There's nine members, so Stand they needed corrected. five votes, and it was Baldwin, the three demons, and Setu that voted to get him off. Ah, okay, okay. Um, so Knox is ousted. And I He's loved- very, very angry. Loved the look on Setu's face when she voted him off. I'm very, mm -hmm. ugh, I'm very excited to see what they do with her this season, since they've changed her so much from the book. Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah. I'm very excited to see what happens there. Yeah, she was very much like, well, but you killed a witch. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was good. Yeah. Um, and then Agatha tells, you know, makes a phone call to tell Nate what happened and tells Nate that he needs to take Sophie and the baby and just leave. Yes. That's it. Like, that's kind of the last that we get from them in this yeah. episode. I'm, I'm sad because I like the, the actors and the characters. There's so much going on this season that it's good to just get them out early mm -hmm. because they're not in the book really at all. Yeah. So it's good to just yeah. goodbye. We've other right before we introduce anybody new, you must leave. Right. Yeah. And then we have another part of the episode that made me cry. The funeral. The funeral. I was really glad yes. they gave Emma a funeral. And I think I've talked about this when we talked about the trailer, but because it is just so weird and abrupt in the book, Emma's dead. We're moving on. I'm I'm glad that they took this moment to be like, let's yeah. let's mourn. I love Diana's casual use of magic to light the candles when she struggled so hard to light candles yes. in season one. Yes, that's good. That was fantastic. And then, you know, Diana struggles with the words of the spell or incantation that they're doing and Sarah comes to help her and it's just beautiful mm -hmm. yeah it made me cry they did a really good job and I like that they continue to use the temple set just because I mm -hmm. I like it it has nothing yeah. to do with anything but I like it yeah I don't really have anything else to say it was a nice little scene and again it really shows that even though they know that they're on limited time because we only get seven episodes this season that they are taking the time to show, mm -hmm. you know, not just what's happening, but why it's happening, why we care about these people. Mm -hmm. And, that's and that these people care about each other. Yes. Which after everybody yelling at each other a lot in this episode, it's yeah. nice to see them not yelling at each other. Yeah. 
That's why. So we the very next scene is just Isabeau and Mart. Yeah. Um, and Isabeau says that she didn't want to go to Emp's funeral given her history with witches. Yeah. Um, which is very thoughtful, but she wants to take care of everybody, and so they light the fires because everybody's going to be cold when they come in, because it's not just vampires there anymore, and she loves them too. I love Isabeau and so it's, much. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's, it is beautiful. It's such a quick scene, but it's it spoke volumes. So, God, so many of the scenes in this episode are so fast because there's just so much they're cramming in. Yep. We do get next quick scene with Sarah and Diana. Sarah apologizes for what she said about the babies. She gives Diana the page. And Diana's all, we'll make Knox pay. She did have the page, like this ancient parchment stuffed into her coat. And I'm really... Oh, that's exactly what Sarah would do, though. <laughs> I'm so surprised that historian Diana didn't lose her shit. Like, and it, it does come out perfectly because it's a TV mm-hmm. show. But like, what if, it, what if it disintegrated in your coat or like just ripped apart? Like, oh my gosh, right. Sarah. But you're right; it is exactly what Sarah would do. I, exactly I, what Sarah would. Do. I didn't even think about that, but no, you're right. Sarah just be like, oh, I gotta get this Diana. Don't want to get her wet. And then Baldwin shows up to Sator, and I hate him. <laughs> Like, to us, Peter Knox is the worst in the world. Mm -hmm. And Baldwin's just like, he's not important. Leave him alone. The vampire murders are more important. That's what we need to focus on. And we're just like, are you blind? Peter Knox is the villain. Take him out. Yeah. But in a way, I kind of like that Matthew gets a bit of his own medicine here. Because he just won't listen to Marcus. Won't, like, just sit down and talk to him. (laughs) And here Baldwin's like, no, shut up. I don't care what you say. So it's like, yeah, no, absolutely. He's like, I am the head of this household, so we're going to do what I say. Yeah. hundred (laughs) percent. I don't treat people the way you want to be treated, Matthew. Jeez. And then we get two dinners, vampire dinner and everybody else. And the fun dinner. Well, not fun because they're Emily's dead. The warm dinner. The warm dinner. Yes. Um, The set design for these two dinners is amazing. Yes. Because... The one that it's not, I mean, there's still more vampires than warm bloods at that table than there are at, you know, the vampire dinner. But it's the the lighting, the fire, the food, the like the entire atmosphere is just so warm and inviting versus Baldwin's dinner where it's just sterile and flat and cold. And you know? I, I do love Miriam being like, well, I know what I know where I'd rather be. And everyone else. Right. The, the downstairs dinner is like, yeah, thank God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think you're going to have to help me out with this mm-hmm. uh, with my memory. Obviously, we met Benjamin last season as Air Fuchs. Yes. Did we hear the name Benjamin in the show last season? I know you and I talked about it because we just knew that this was yeah, Benjamin. Yeah, that's hard to remember because we talked about him so much and referred to him as Benjamin. What did he introduce himself as? I'm, I'm, did he use his first name when he introduced himself? No, 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 he didn't. Because, I mean, even Di- when Diana's like, I think I met him, you know, she says he didn't say he was de Claremont or, you know, he just used the name Fuchs. Yeah. Unless, actually, that might answer one of my questions when... Uh-huh. Um, my next question, because this, this all kind of goes together. Um, so real quick, Baldwin brings up an old story of a vampire in which you had a child, blah, 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 which, of course, is exciting news. Like, why have we never heard this before? No, this is the stupidest um, part. But he also mentions Benjamin here. Yeah. And it's just like, it's so casual. Like, that's right around the time you sired Benjamin. Uh-huh. And... um Matthew, of course, has had enough, and he leaves, and Diana stands up and goes with him, and Baldwin's like, no, anybody who's not a Claremont has to leave by morning, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. So then we get the scene with Diana and Matthew, and Diana asks about Benjamin, and so Matthew tells the story. Mm-hmm. And my note here is Diana makes a grand leap that she thinks she met him. <laughs> I'm like, what is tying this Benjamin person to this other person that she met in Bohemia. Like, how is she making that leap? And if he did use the name Benjamin, if it was Benjamin Fuchs or whatever, that makes Mm -hmm. more sense. But if it was just, he just knew his name, he was a vampire, and, 
like he could smell the blood vow. Like, how do you make that leap to, oh, my God, I think I met him? I don't know. They've cut out a lot of stuff in the book. So if you've read the book, you can be like, well, maybe when Baldwin saw the blood vow on Diana, he mentioned that it would really be super obvious to somebody to a de Claremont. Although Matthew doesn't have Philippe's blood technically. Oh, but it was a de Claremont vow. So because I do remember them. I, I think they talked about that in the book, that the that it would that all vampires would see, it, but it would be super loud and obvious mm. to a de Claremont. Now I'm afraid I'm making that up. Ugh. OK, that may be why she said, because what she said here was, you know, she did immediately recall back that this person that she met mm-hmm. could s- could see the blood vow or smell it or, or however yeah. vampires do. And so maybe they were trying to make that connection. Um, it just wasn't super clear um, and felt like a giant leap for Diana to say, oh, I think I met this person that I've never heard you talk about before that just happens to, to be important this season. Yeah, so I think the show is trying to get a lot done here with with this these con- conversations about Benjamin and Matthew and the mentioning that that they've heard of witches and vampires having children before. They even say that Matthew's heard of it before, who didn't fucking mention it last season. Right? I uh, or I really think they did a disservice to the show. I know we've talked about this every season, but they really did a disservice to the show cutting out from season one that people knew it was a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. I I agree. Um, Because this is very obviously like we need to get Benjamin mentioned and we need to get that vampires know about this mentioned and that there's records of it. Because otherwise, blah, 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 spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like not to really get onto the spoilers here, but they need to make that connection between mm-hmm. the children and Benjamin at the same time. So it, it really just feels like they needed to say all the things here and they didn't care that some of it doesn't make sense. Yeah, maybe. <sighs> In- including have- Diana's weird leap and the fact that mm-hmm. there's even no real point to her making the connection. Like, why does why do they need to know that that person was Benjamin? Right. It doesn't it doesn't make sense. It's enough that Other the audience than- knows. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Especially since they called us back to it in the previously on. Yeah. Um, we didn't need Diana to remind us that we know who this person is. Um, well, unless, I mean, to be fair, I think when they're, when they're writing episodes, they don't know what the previous Leon is going to be. So there is that. Maybe that's what it was. But I mean, it's also possible if he didn't use the name Benjamin in season two, then that is the way that they just brought that connection together is by Diana telling us, oh, I think that was Benjamin. Maybe. Okay. That's a good point. That's a good point. Because I guess if you didn't read the books, you wouldn't know that. We are going to have so many listeners writing in to tell us how wrong we are right now. No, but which is great, great. I, I like I want to be corrected yeah. just because I cannot remember. But but no, that is a good point. If they didn't use the name Benjamin last season and we're just remembering it cuz we talked about him so much. Yeah. I think that might be it. Um and that's why they needed Diana to draw that connection. Yes, okay, because otherwise it is just like we have seen this murderous vampire in Elizabethan times and modern day now and we well and we saw him in modern day last last season also but we didn't know that he was Benjamin okay mm-hmm. so then Diana mentioning that that's who it was I guess that does do something for the audience but yes well, how and why she would make that leap who the fuck knows yeah um then we get a quick scene with Gallo Glass and Marcus which is I nice love um it. I, I love that Gallo Glass keeps talking about his dad, um, yeah. Hugh, uh, and that we get, you know, Fernando later talking about Hugh. I, I love it. Um, but Gallo Glass and Marcus have the great idea to start a scion because that's what Hugh did. I will say um, also I love that they talk bad about Philippe, which I don't think we ever saw in the first three books. I 
feel, if I'm remembering correctly, it wasn't until Times Convert that Marcus was oh. like, no, we, we really need to criticize Philippe sometimes. He wasn't like the best person ever. He did some shit. Mm. And so I like that they put Gallo Glass and Marcus here talking like, yeah, Philippe is kind mm. of an asshole sometimes. Yeah. Well, he was. And you know what? So is Matthew. Oh, yeah. Because Matthew, he does listen to them. I will give him credit for that. He listens to their idea, but shoots it down immediately. I don't like his reasoning for shooting it down. Um, He says something like, you're asking me to turn my back on my family and those who made me who I am or something like that. And maybe it's just they don't clearly explain what Scion actually means. But based on the information they gave us in the episode, that feels like an overreaction. Well, two things. Um, It definitely feels like an overreaction because the only people who wouldn't join Matthew in his scion that we've met is Baldwin. You know, we're not, we, they don't have the time in the show to introduce us to any of the other de Claremont children. Like right. Varen's not here. Uh, Baldwin's sister, Varen. Mm-hmm. And a whole bunch of, you know, we just don't even know. Like, as far as we know, it's just Baldwin. Right. <laughs> in which case, why the fuck would you not form a scion? Right? Scion? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, but also, I think it's important to remember that Matthew hates himself. Like, d- doubts himself mm. a lot is, and is angry at himself throughout this whole episode. And so I don't think it's necessarily like what he's saying. I don't think is what he's thinking. I think he's thinking, okay. no, I don't deserve this. Okay. That's fair. I think, I think you're right. He does. He doesn't blame Marcus for M's death. He blames himself for not being there. Yeah. And he blames himself for all of these things that are happening because he wasn't able to be there and protect them like he hasn't been able to take care of Knox right like, yeah I think you're right a lot of it is internal for him it's just it doesn't come across that way super well sometimes that's that's fair but I think that's accurate to Matthew as a character also yeah that's fair and another good bit when Baldwin was talking to Matthew earlier and they were talking about the blood rage murders Baldwin mentions that it's going to be Matthew's uh, responsibility to take care mm-hmm. of that. And he, I forget what the exact line is, but he says something like, you know, best to play to your strengths or do what you're good at, mm-hmm. implying that this will not be the first time that Matthew, who is a blood rage vampire, fully afflicted, has been used to take out blood rage vampires. Well, yeah, but we knew that already. Like, Did we? I, I genuinely yeah, don't Yeah, no, we knew that from season two. Like, I mean, Philippe used Matthew as his assassin for everything, including... We've learned that in the show, not in the books. I'm like, 99% sure we had that conversation great, wonderful, in the show. Wonderful. Pretty sure that was in the show. I'm not 100% sure about that, but... I'm... Well, I said 99. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. But yeah, he was Philippe's blood rage assassin. Yeah. Basically. And now Baldwin is like, ooh, now you're my assassin. Yep. Yep. All right. Then everybody leaves the tour. We go to London and we meet Fernando. Okay. Before that, though, they leave in the weirdest way. Some people <laughs> are allowed in the helicopter. Some people are not. Like, Miriam is literally at the same house as them in London, but she had to drive presumably to an airport and catch a different helicopter or plane or I don't know or did she want well, they didn't have room for they didn't have room for everybody in the helicopter, the I helicopter mean, was there was full. a whole cameraman in there they could have taken <laughs> him out and had room for one tiny little Miriam that's fair I totally get Marcus and Phoebe being in their own car but you know maybe Miriam needed her car like maybe I I, I don't know I got nothing which um, means she would yeah. have had to take the ferry like I just can't picture Maybe that in my did. head. I cannot Maybe picture. Maybe she did. Vampires taking the ferry between France and England. But yes, Fernando, yay. Yep, we, we quickly meet Fernando, um, and we learn that he was Hugh's mate. Mm-hmm. Um, and Hugh, of course, has died. Um, but that's all That's all we get right there is a quick, like Sarah's like, who's that? And, and we find out. Um, then we jump to more quick recaps. Matthew telling Miriam about the page. They learned that the book was made out of creatures. Mm-hmm. 
and they want to use it to find out more where creatures come from and how blood rage works because it has to all be tied together. Like, mm-hmm. now they're finally starting to bring everything from season one and season two together. Yes. They need a lab to work in. Which, um, oh my God, they have a fucking lab. <sighs> Right, like they're in London. They have Matthew's lab, right? So why well, do they need okay. another lab? To be fair, the lab from season one is in Oxford, uh, not London. But also that implies that they have the money to just get a lab or whatever. I don't I don't know how that works, but yeah. that they could just rent. Rent a lab? Is that a thing? I don't know. Or kick somebody out. Or like, here's a million dollars. Look the other way. You know, like, or pounds. They're in England. Um <laughs> I just, oh. it, I, I get that they need, that they brought Chris in and I'm really thankful because I love Chris as a character, but it made a lot more sense when in the book, when they were in a completely different country and right. decided that they didn't just need a lab, they needed a team. Right. Which based on, I mean, they're going to get a team, I think. They um, are, but it, it doesn't make sense the way right now it got yeah, there. Like they're not that far from Oxford. Oh, uh, in Matthew's lab. They're not. No, they're not. I mean, I wouldn't want to commute there from London every day, but they could have just gone to Oxford instead of London. Yes. Right. But we meet Chris, who is now inexplicably in London. Um, his lab is nice and blue. Yeah. It also looks like <laughs> it's in the basement. Which I guess. I mean, why not? I think I just picture most labs in the basement anyway. To be fair, the season one lab kind of had a basement quality to it also. Yeah, 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 it did. Maybe it's an England thing. Um, well, I mean, because all I mean, all the buildings in England are super old, so in the that basement, yeah. actually, does make sense. <laughs> all the above ground stuff is lies. It's all underground. Yeah. Um. Then we get another quick scene with Sarah and Fernando, and this is one of my favorite scenes in that this, episode. This is the scene that convinced me that they're not going to fuck this season up with the less episodes because they took the time to have these two have their connection that they had in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Fernando brings her coffee and she just says, nobody talks about M. And I love that one, she felt comfortable enough to say that to this new person mm-hmm. who's a vampire. And then she's like, you, you vampires are only take care of yourself. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, like she's, she's vulnerable and open with him. And he gives her the care and the space that she needs. Um, tells her his story, neither my loss nor my grief were acknowledged, and explains that she at least has family that acknowledged who M was and who M was to her. And it's it's beautiful. It's beautiful to watch them talk about grief and to see the dichotomy of Fernando lost Hugh 700 years ago, and while his grief isn't as readily visible on the surface as Sarah's is, Mm -hmm. it's still there. You know, he even says grief never really goes away. Yeah. Um, You know, sometimes it gets better and it's slower and sometimes it rushes back like the ocean. And that is one of the best descriptions of grief I've, I've seen. Beautiful, beautiful scene. It was very good. And it's another instance where they show us that Philippe was a bit of an ass as much as we like him. Yeah. I mean, we knew, yeah, we love him, but he was definitely an ass when Diana first showed up. True. Back to Chris, because, of course, he doesn't believe in witches and blood rage vampires. He's a scientist. Right, of course. Um, I love this scene where Diana shows him. There's a couple things that are happening. Mm-hmm. Did you happen to notice that Matthew is sitting there? And you can see him sitting at the counter, like, right next to the sink where she's doing the thing with the water. Mm -hmm. And he's just tapping his fingers on the counter, like, just waiting for this to be done, for Chris to come around. And I was like, that's beautiful. (laughs) I did notice the finger tapping, which I think think also, though, a little bit of that is Matthew being nervous, I might say. Because I don't think he wants Diana to tell people. Yeah, no, that's true, too. He's never, it's, they've never exposed themselves to humans before. Yeah. And now they're doing it on purpose. Yeah. Have you watched the episode two yet? I have not. Oh. I have not. It's got some good stuff. So, um, but I'm, I'm super on board with, um, I think his name is, I don't know how to say it, Ivano. Ivano Jeremiah plays Chris. 
Oh, and we're saying actor names, are we? We're saying oh, for him. This is the one that I looked up because I wanted to give him props for this scene because the look on his face when he sees what Diana can do, it's like you could blow him over. Like if you just blew on him or touched him with a feather, he would just fall out. Like he had that look of incredulity just down. And I thought it was great. And so I wanted, I looked up his name so that I could say something about it. Gotcha. That was good. And then I, I really loved how he was immediately like, is that on a molecular, are you doing that on a molecular level? Mm -hmm. Or whatever. (laughs) Immediately wants the science of it. It's fantastic. Yes, that was really good. (laughs) Um. So we've got a lab, we've got a scientist, things are great, we're going to move on. Mm -hmm. And then we get Domenico. No, wait, this is the best bit. Well, not the best, but I love this. I love that Domenico is still like, please, please just let me into your club. I just want (laughs) to be included. I have information. Please, somebody include me. Right? And Baldwin's like, no, wait, you're you're against me. And he's like, no, 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 no. I'm against Blood Rage Vampires, not you. And yeah. he's like, no, 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 you are helping Jer Bear. And he's like, no, 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 that was Jer Bear, not me. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, Domenico. Like, <laughs> I pick a side, dude. I he will as soon as somebody lets him into the club. You know, as gives soon him as he the figures out who's password. actually gonna win. <laughs> I, I love this bit. This continuing, I love that they've given him this characteristic of kind of being a loner who doesn't want to be a loner. Mm. It's so good. Yeah. And I find it yeah. hilarious how he'll always just be like, I have information. Please be my friend. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. No, that's exactly what he does. Yeah. That's exactly what he does. Okay. My next note is probably going to be a controversial opinion. mm a truly awful rendition of Will the Circle Be Unbroken starts to play. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard it before, so it was fine for me. Oh, okay. It's a it's a very uh, well-known um, kind of gospel song, particularly in the Bible Belt where I live. That would explain why I've um, never heard it before. Uh, possibly, but I, I did not enjoy this rendition. Like, I get what they were trying to do with it, and I think that if it had just been the music, it would have been okay, mm-hmm. but the vocals with it did not work for me. Um, it just, it took it too far into campy, hmm. and it did, I didn't like it. Um, I can almost guarantee you I've never heard it before. Interesting. I, cer- I certainly didn't recognize it. I had to Google it. Okay. Um, so then we get Benjamin. He knows Math- Matthew and Diana are back. He gets an uh, unknown call or a call from an unknown person. Yeah. So somebody's feeding him information. Somebody that we probably know of. Um, then we get Baldwin looking at all of the crime scene photos. Um, I don't know what we're supposed to feel watching that because he's just standing there surrounded by, you know, it's like any detective show where the detective is sitting there looking at all the crime scene photos, trying to figure out what's going on. Like, Nothing happens. He doesn't have this look of recognition or, oh, my God, I know who's doing it. He's just looking at I think we're just people. setting up where everyone is. Um, and then Benjamin leaves his hotel room with a bloodbath inside and smiles a deliciously evil smile when the housekeeper screams because she's discovered it. Like, I think that one scene sums up Benjamin more than anything else. The actor's great. He was so good there. He he is he's good. Like he understands this character. Um, and then I wrote down next time Father Hubbard, Benjamin. Accurate. I'm excited so. for modern day Father Hubbard. I'm not sure how I feel about modern day Father Hubbard. He looks weird in a suit. Oh no, he looks he looks fucking weird. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but I'm just like so. excited to see him. I mean, I've already watched the next episode, so I have seen him. Mm. But you know what I'm saying. I'm excited to see. Yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I am excited about watching the next episode, um, but I didn't want to confuse my thoughts for this episode. Mm. So I waited um, because I, I mean, you see how confused I am just trying to remember what happened last season. Um, If I had watched something else that had these characters in it right now, I would totally think they did these things in this episode. To be fair, I think our confusion this time comes from knowing the books a little too well because I genuinely don't remember if. Like, I think you're right. I think the name Benjamin was not at all mentioned by anyone last season. So. Yeah. 
I don't yeah, know. I don't think so. I really don't. I think, and I mean, even although, again, I don't know why they really needed to make that leap because, yeah, audiences are smart. We, my complaints about most television shows are, oh, they think we're dumb here. Yeah. Um, I talked about my favorite bits as we went through. Did you have specific? I think Domenico might have been your favorite. Well, bit. it just makes me so happy that he's still like, I want to be in the treehouse, please. Yeah. Well, I'm glad he didn't die. I think we left at the end of last season, not sure if he was going to survive, didn't we? When he got attacked. No, we saw him like sit back on the couch and reevaluate his life choices. Oh, okay. We did. Um, okay. Sorry. My favorite part. I do love Domenico because it's just a fun thing that they've done with this like nothing character from the book. I, mm-hmm. I, and I really like it. This isn't like I loved Diana's sweater so much. <laughs> from the beginning i want that sweater i want it's so pretty like if you're not looking directly at it it kind of looks white but then when you mm-hmm. look directly at it it's kind of rainbowy it's so great i love it a lot that genuinely her no. sweater might have been my favorite thing in this episode i feel like you could probably make that sweater well i'd need to buy the right yarn and find a pattern for it and i just i'm not <laughs> that sounds like a whole thing Okay, that's fair, but I, I am just saying, I, I think you could do it. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, Knox getting voted off the council and being a little shit. Mm. Uh, yeah, no, having a just even just a smidgen of consequence. Yes, please. Yeah, I'm here for it. Yeah, I will say we talked about will the circle be unbroken? The first song that plays in the cold open, I'm fairly certain, w- was an original for the show. Okay. Um, yeah, my, f- I don't think my phone recognized it. My phone also didn't recognize the cover of Will the Circle Be Unbroken, so it's a new cover. Yeah. Uh, um, I googled some of the lyrics, but, like, just the way that it fit with, um, the original music that we've heard before, so I knew mm-hmm. it was written by, um, well, I looked up nobody's names, but the composer for the show, so I'm, mm-hmm. I'm fairly certain it was original for the show. Yeah, it was... Um, I remember thinking that it sounded really nice. Yeah. That's the best I've got. <laughs> Rob Lane. That's the comparison. Rob Lane, yes. Thank you. Um, which fits because uh, other seasons have had a couple of his original yeah. songs. So, mm-hmm. fingers crossed I'm not wrong. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's it-ish. Did we want to go into some spoilers? Um, you know, I think we've already done enough spoilery-ish things in this That's episode. True. We have not um, been without very... meaning to. Yeah. Well, and yeah. so I think, I think next week will really get us into where we want to be for that section. So let's let's just hold it until then. Okay. So I guess that's that. Um. So we'd love to know what you think about season three so far. You can tweet at us at Desire Made Real. I'm Caitlin, and you can follow me and find my other shows on Twitter at Inferior Caitlin. All right. Well, I am Andy Kay, and you can find this show and all of the other Eloquent Gushing shows at eloquentgushing.com. We are also on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Eloquent Gushing, or you can give me a shout out on Twitter at Mandy Kay. Join us next week as we talk about episode two, when more people from the past return. And until we meet again, remember that with every ending, there is a new beginning. Mm-hmm.